All right, Luke chapter number six, we're on to traitors. And one of the signs of the last days is traitors and heady and high-minded. Uh, when you think of traitors, you think of somebody like Judas Iscariot, Benedict Arnold, Brutus back in the days of Caesar. Uh, a, a traitor is an individual who violates an allegiance. Uh, he violates a friend trip, betray, uh, betrays his country or the individual that he's committed to. They can have a traitor uh, betraying a wedding vow or promises to each other. Um, aids an enemy in overcoming the person that he's betraying. Remember when Judas Iscariot came up to the Lord, he kissed the Lord on the cheek as if they had this great, wonderful relationship and the Lord sarcastically calls him friend. He's being sarcastic because he's saying, if you were a real friend, you wouldn't betray me. Now, just so that you know, so that you get the proper context to where we're going with that uh, tonight, you're ambassadors from another country. And so when it comes to betraying that other country or betraying uh, the Lord that died for you, it maybe puts it in a different context for you. I remember years ago, and I'll let you be seated after this and read a verse of Scripture here. Years ago, the old preacher was at a youth camp in Mariana, and I had the privilege of being over there with him, and, and he was preaching. And he preached a message, and I, I can't remember the exact name. I think Not Ashamed, I think, is the name of the message. It's a great message. But what he did there was is he drew a picture of a kid. They were getting his youth camp, so he's getting ready to kids to go back to school. And he's got a kid standing out there by his locker, and he's being surrounded. And he's got these little bubbles of the kids making statements about and saying things about different things. And uh, they got the kid over here, and the kid's in the position of, is he going to take the side of Jesus Christ? or you're going to listen to his friends. And standing over there with a crown of thorns and a loincloth and been beaten is Jesus Christ standing back here uh, behind the friends. And you get the picture in your mind of, are you going to betray Christ or are you going to betray your friends? I've never forgotten that picture. I wish I could paint like that. That picture stuck with me. I saw him deal with that thing and I thought to myself, well, that that's what happens pretty much on a daily basis. You know, people have choices nowadays. They have the opportunity to make a decision. And every day that decision bo basically boils down right there. Are you going to choose him or are you going to betray him? One of you is going to the cross. Luke chapter number 6, just for an opening place here. And then we'll uh, have Brother Brad pray for us. Luke chapter 16, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 6, excuse me, and make it verse number 16. Luke 6, 16. And Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was what? The traitor. the traitor. Brother Brad, you pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. And let me say this. I know some of you think I'm shining you on when I tell you this. I'm not buttering you up and I'm not getting you fat to kill for the slaughter or getting ready to tar and feather you. Uh, I honestly, if I had choices, uh, I wouldn't want to be where I, well, anywhere other than where I am. I wouldn't want to be going through this with anybody but you. You folks have been exemplary in the way that you've handled things. Now, you have to trust me when I tell you I have the privilege of dealing with uh, people in a, in a multitude of different places. Everybody's not handling it as well as you are. And you may feel like sometimes you're coming apart at the seams and you may feel like things are, are not going well and there's uncertainty and maybe even a little bit of panic. But you're still here, you're still coming, you're still trying. And that's, that is exemplary. All the Lord expects of you is to just keep showing up. It's not always to be perfect. It just keeps showing up. You mess up, you get up, you go on and, and, and do that. But you just consistently keep showing up, keep doing what you're supposed to do in spite of the difficulty that's going on. And for me, there's nobody else I'd rather be with. There's nobody else I'd rather serve with. I consider us being the same pot together and we're trying to finish this thing out. And I hope and pray, I told a friend of mine at lunch today, I hope and pray that this is it. I hope this is the, the end of everything. I don't know whether it's the end. I'm going to be kind of bold what I'm about to say. I couldn't tell you if it's going to be the setup for the rapture or the end of America. Sure as I'm standing here, America's got it coming. And sooner or later, the Lord's going to have to say at some point, I've had enough. I've warned you and I've warned you and I've warned you and I've warned you and I've warned you. He doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is, is just pull his hand back and just sit back and watch. If nothing else, we'll wind up destroying ourselves. I don't know which it is. What I'm praying is, is Lord help me to be what you want me to be and whatever it is until you snatch me out of here or until you kill me one. Help me to just be able to take one day at a time. If I could encourage you with one thing, if you don't get anything else I say tonight, if I could just encourage you to keep putting one foot in front of the other. 
just one foot in front of the other. If you feel like you're going to panic, stop for just a second and breathe a little bit and then put one foot in front of the other because I don't care who you think you know and who you think you're listening to. Nobody knows who holds tomorrow but him. And your life could turn on a dime. I got a call from a fellow in Alabama that just called me a second ago to give me an update on a dear friend of ours and some things that are going on there and stuff like that. Life for them has completely turned 180 out simply because of some things that have gone on privately, personally. And all of a sudden, the things that seem to be panic in the world ain't bothering them at all. They're in some real trouble, personal trouble about some things. So all I'd suggest is one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. Try to keep your nose between the pages of the book. Uh, it's hard to do sometimes. It's tempting to just get your mind on a whole bunch of other things. Now, when it comes to traitors, the Lord's talking about this, and the guy by the name of Peter comes to mind. Though you wouldn't naturally think that Peter would have been a betrayer, but Peter was a betrayer. Peter was told, flat out, plain and simple, he said, Peter, you're going to betray me before the night's over. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I don't know if you've ever done that or not. I don't know if you've ever said, Lord, I'll never betray you. And then the Holy Spirit says to you, pass out a track. And you say, uh, not so, Lord. <laughs> you say, Lord, I, never me. I would never betray you, Lord. I, I, I'll never betray you. I remember right down here off of Loretta Road. This is a bajillion years ago. Man, this, is, this has been old oh, back when we first got started here. I was still a policeman at the time. So it's been a, a long time ago. Uh, when Dixie was there, we lived down there off of Loretta Road back, in the, uh, back there in that part of the area, the town off of Ladden something or another, Ladden Road back there, narrow Oak Lane. Anyhow, I went up to get some bread and milk or something, which is real unusual. She does all of that stuff and all that. And I don't know, I must have been feeling an extra helping of grace that day or something. I have no idea. I had on flip flops and a pair of jeans and a, a, a sweatshirt or a t-shirt or something like that looked real pastoral, you know, and, and I went up there to the Winn Dixie store, and there's four black guys sitting out by the curb in the fire lane. And that kind of stirred me up just a little bit. I, I'm, and, there, and, and there's so much dope in the car, if they'd have rolled the windows down, I'd have got high going by. You know, of course, I did not inhale, but, it, but at any rate, uh, I go by there and I look in there. And the Lord, sure as I'm standing here, the Lord said, not, vote, not like bu burning bush, Moses stuff. I mean, you know, not speaking to me on the road to Damascus. Sure as I'm standing here, you know what the Lord said? Why don't you give them boys a track? I said, I, I said well, Lord, I just, I, I don't believe, I, I don't, I ain't got, I, I'll get it on the way back out. Now, I'm just to be honest with you. I'll tell you what. I'm, now, I'm a preacher. You understand? Amen. Bold lion for God. <laughs> Standing in the pulpit. The bird with the word kind of a thing, right? I'm up here and I'm preaching and stuff like that. Back in the building, sometimes preach as much as two hours. Preach myself completely hoarse. The Lord said, give them guys a track. Um, um, I, yeah, Lord, I, I, I don't have one on me now, but I'll get it on, on, on the way back out. I'll, 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 I'll do that. Drano always keeps some right there in the, in the dash, in the console. There's some in there. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get it on the way back. Now, here's what I'm thinking. By the time I come back out, that's not real disobedience. That's, I, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm just procrastinating a little bit. Y'all probably have never done that. You're not, you, you, never, you never think of that. But, but I did. But I, I intended to do well. But in my mind, I was thinking, they'll be gone when I come out. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Me, why would I be afraid of doing that? Well, then I get in there and I'm going through and I get whatever it is that we had to have. Milk, bread, eggs or something or another. I have no idea. And we got all that kind of, probably some ice cream in there somewhere or whatever. And I, I, I get ready and I put the stuff in the basket. And the Lord said, okay, now you're going to go get a track. And I'm like, well, Lord, they're probably gone, you know, and I got my hands full and stuff. And, 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 I, and I walk by and they're still sitting right there. And I'm thinking, oh, Mike and back. Then I get in the car and I'm like, now, Lord, now here's the problem. If I go up there and I approach them, they're going to have a confrontation and there's going to be something. And then I'm going to have to Johnny Law them and all that kind of a deal. And Lord, you know, I, I mean, I just don't know that that's a great thing. They're going to probably think I'm trying to do something or whatever. And the Lord said, just hand them a track. I said, Lord, you know, we're not supposed to get involved in things in our neighborhood. And you know what the general orders and the SOPs say. And, and after all, I mean, I don't look very pastoral. I know you all never do this. I know, you don't, I know you don't argue back. If somebody were to see me, they'd think, that guy's nuts. What's wrong with him? Because I'm having a conversation under my breath, but I'm like talking to myself. That's what they're thinking. I get in the car and I crank that thing up and I drive right past them. I can see him right over here out of the passenger window. I drive right past them. And I drove down there to Loretta Road and I hung a right-hand turn, came out right by the Sino Cat place there. And I turned on the right-hand road and I didn't get a half a block down the road. And the Lord said, my, 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 my. <laughs> Why, you traitor you? You betrayer you? You're my friend, are you? 
You don't think I can protect you? How many things I've protected you against already? You wouldn't even be standing here and some things run through my mind and I'm thinking, oh, well, yeah, you did do, oh, yeah, you did do that too. Oh, well, yeah, you did do that. You think I can't, if I tell you to give them a track, you think I can't protect you? I'm, I'm telling you about your pastor now. You don't be thinking too highly of me. I mean, I'd turn from a peacock to a chicken right quick, right there on the spot, man. I mean, you know, all I didn't do was lay an egg, boy, but I'm just telling you, man. I mean, I'm, you know, buck, 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 you know, and I'm driving out there and, and that kind of bold as a lion telling you to be a witness and stuff. I said, Lord, if you let them be there when you get back, Lord, if you let them be there, I made a U-turn right there on Loretta Road. And I guess a bunch of people knew me or recognized me or something. They're waving at me all kind of funny ways and stuff and blowing the horn. And I mean, I'm like, yeah, hey, how are y'all? Good to see you too. I didn't know all these people were watching me. And I, I said, man, Lord, please let them be there. Please let them be there. Please let them be there. And I pull up there and they're still sitting there. And I walked up there and I tapped on the driver's window. And he looks up at me. I can see his face just as plain as day. I could pick him up out of the lineup. And look, of course, he's probably older than that now. And I tapped on the window like that, and he turned the music down, rolled that thing down, and boy, that billow of smoke comes rolling out of that deal where they've been smoking tater, and they're just, I mean, just blowing, you know, uh, smoking a joint. And, and that stuff's coming out of there, I mean, to beat the band. I said, I'd like to give you something. <laughs> and I said, uh, guys, I'd like to give you something if I could. And the guy in the back seat, sitting in the back passenger side, he said, that guy's a preacher. And I've got on a t-shirt and jeans and flip-flops. And the other guy in the back seat said, my auntie told me this was going to happen. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah! Yeah, and I'm here to fling her down too. Bless God, I'm, on, I'm here to preach at you. You know, that kind of a thing. You know, I'm kind of like, I said, fellas, I believe the Lord told me I ought to give you this. And the guy back on the back side over there, you know what he said? He said, Preacher, I know you're right. I ain't been doing what I need to be doing. I said, well, maybe you guys can read this, share this track among in, and here you go. Man, I went home, and I threw them groceries on that butcher block back in those days and set that thing, and I went back to my office. I got out and cried like a baby in my office. You say, why? Traitor. Traitor. Cotton-picking chicken. Worried about somebody... Uh, uh, what, saying something to me, being rude to me, laughing at me, making fun of me, and that kind of a deal. It had nothing to do with a racial deal. you got to be kidding me, man. I rode that whole area of town for years and years and years. That stuff never bothered me, never entered my mind. Don't worry about that. I was a chicken for Jesus Christ. He said, could you give him a track? And I wouldn't even give him a track. I can relate to Peter. Peter, not so, Lord, never happened. A little girl comes out there. Aren't you that apostle? I knew. Yeah, you were the. I saw you five barley loaves, two fish. You were there passing out the plates and stuff. That boy brought you all that stuff. I, I was. I was there. I was right there when Lazarus came. I remember. I remember so and so. I. I. I think. Yeah, you. You're that guy. You're that big fisherman. That's you. Peter cusses and swears and tells all kind of stuff. He goes, No, no, not me. And the Lord says, Really? Before the cock cries twice, you're going to deny me thrice. Traitor, traitor. Little other handmaid comes out there a little later on and says, you hurt my friend's feelings pretty bad. You said some pretty rude things to her. You were kind of unkind to her and that kind of a deal like that. Aren't you with that man from Galilee? Aren't you with that? Aren't you the fisherman that he picked up off of there? He used to uh, run the commercial fishing and stuff like that. He cusses and swears at hers and embarrasses her to fare thee well. She's a little maid girl, a little pure little girl out there just serving them coffee and tea and water or whatever they got by the campfire. Cusses and swears and jumps up and down, has a conniption fit traitor and boy that bird goes off in the morning and rooster crows and the Lord comes out of the praetorium beat to a fare thee well covered in spittle and he comes walking out there and all he does is cut his eyes at Peter and what do you think those eyes said I'll tell you what they said they said traitor I'll tell you what they said and they're leaning over the battlements of heaven 30 years ago and they look at a guy who's big as a bull back in those days and relatively pretty healthy in those days. And I'm over there running like a little girl. It didn't even take a little girl. They never even spoke to me. Those four guys were as kind to me. I mean, they showed a respect. Preacher, sorry about that. And we turned the music down and apologized for this and that and the other and so on and so forth. I mean, they were no threat. 
Boy, with an army of traitors like that, you couldn't get much done for Jesus Christ. But I'm, I know you wouldn't be the same way. But yet in the last days, you know what he said? Traitor. Sell out. Sell out and support your enemy against the cause of Christ. Sell out and help your enemy to defeat the cause of Christ. Sell out and join hands with individuals that are contrary to the cause of Christ. Now, again, I know you folks wouldn't do that, but I'm telling you, boy, he sure got my attention. He sure showed me what a coward I was. Big difference in standing in a pulpit with a bunch of Christians and you walk up to a stranger and the Lord said, could you hand him a track? I didn't even have the boldness of my wife. We get on an airplane. My wife sits down next to somebody. Hey, how are you doing? It sure is nice to see you today. It sure is a wonderful day. It's a beautiful day. We're just doing absolutely wonderful. We were, my husband's a pastor and we're coming in. We're flying to so-and-so. He's going to preach a revival. I'm like, honey, could, I... You know, here's flight 741. We're going to crash before you... I hope you know where you're going when you die. <laughs> Babe, can you... Really, it's like, babe, you can't pass out those tracks, especially not, she didn't do, yes, honest, I'm not just preaching, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling you, she did. She had a whole stack full of 740, that's after the 9-11 stuff. She's passing out the, the crash of 741 or whatever the thing was. And, you know, I'm thinking somebody's going to be reading that thing and going, this lady says we're going to crash. I am said, baby, get the greatest gift or something like that to give them out that kind of... She stuffs them in the, in the, the magazine. This is before the COVID thing where people would actually read the magazine. Now nobody will touch anything. She stuffs them in the magazine. She's kind of like, this will get them. She's always now slipping them out there, speaking to everybody and stuff like that. I'm just like, get me off the plane. Get me away from these people. She don't meet a stranger. There may be some things wrong with her, but boy, I'll tell you what, she's got some of you beat when it comes to being bold for Christ. She's never been ashamed of Jesus that I know of in my life. And if you have, I don't want to know about it. But you know what she does? I mean, I mean, she ain't perfect. But she sure has been faithful for over 30 years. Amen. And you know what I've watched her? I've been with her longer than you have. I've been with her for 40 years. You know what I've never seen? I've never seen her betray Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good statement. I'd have to stand before the Lord right now and give an account, and I'd have to say, not me, Lord. I'm like Peter. I'm like Judas. I'm like Ahithophel. I'm like Absalom. I have to take my name numbered among the transgressors. I'm a traitor. That's a hard pill to swallow because you think you're loyal until the Lord just asks you to do a little tiny thing. Now, I've tried not to let it happen since, but that sticks with me like glue. When I see traitor, I'm going through this thing and I'm thinking, you, I got, do I have to tell that story? Lord, they've heard that illustration. Drina said I need to fresh my illustrations and, and don't tell jokes because you're not funny. Uh, but Lord, I mean, you know, I mean, I, that, that, they've heard the illustration before. Lord said that one. I, I, I understand, Lord, but I said they've already heard it. I'll just make a reference to it. No, tell the whole story. Show them what a coward you are. You think that's fun for me to do? You think that's fun for her to sit there and have to listen to what her husband had to do? Do you think that she enjoys that? Well, oh, I'm proud of him. <laughs> a coward who wouldn't even hand some young men a track. Preached on the street, stood on a fountain down there with a bunch of people in my squad and all laughing at me and stuff like that. No problem at all. The Lord said, okay, this just me and you, okay, bud? How about you? I'm not asking you on a lion's den or a fiery furnace. Just give him a track. Why, you traitor, you. You say, well, yeah, but you turned around and made it right. Yeah, but what if they hadn't have been there? Mm -hmm. yeah. But what if they hadn't have been there? I'm glad their radiator got seized up or the, the pistons got hung up and the ring threw a rod or the rings busted or something. I don't know what it was that made them sit right there. I don't know how come somebody didn't come out. They're parked right there in the middle of the fire lane and stuff. I don't know why somebody didn't come out, except I think that whole thing was probably just a bunch of angels in there just sitting around there and the Lord checking me out. That's what I've always thought. I don't think them guys needed a track from me. I don't think they needed anything to gospel. I don't, they didn't have some big revival meeting and they, four of them got called to preach and they went and set the world on fire. I think the Lord used that to show me how quick I'd run if it was inconvenient for me. You make the same conditions when it comes running across the channels, don't you? Make the same, same, same situation when it comes to letting that bitterness go, don't you? Do the same thing when you're clicking that rat, don't you? Ain't that what it's called, a rat? 
Notice what he says in uh, Jude chapter or Jude 8. I mean, just come to Jude 8. Traitors, treacherous, willful betrayal, a violation of allegiance. I like the Marine Corps. Some of the closest friends I've ever had were in the Marine Corps. I remember going up to Washington and Jim asked me, he said, hey, you know, you go with me over to the Vietnam Memorial. I said, yeah. He said, I lost a lot of friends over there and I made it back. And he said, he said it bothers me because I wasn't even saved when I was over there. If I'd have gotten killed over there and should have gotten killed, he said, I'd have been dead and in hell and I'd have been burning. And he said, a lot of my friends didn't make it back. And I remember going to that thing and going up there to Vietnam and at the top of that portion of the wall there for his battalion or whatever, it says the two words, it says Semper Fi, which he said that means always faithful, never run, always faithful. And I got a picture of him, and it's a great picture. It means a lot to me. But in that polished off granite right there, I'm behind him taking a picture. And you can see my reflection looking back at him out of that wall right there. And he's got his fingers on a couple of his buddies right there that were in his battalion and all that stuff that died over there. And he's got his head kind of bowed, and he's praying for those guys, and he's looking like that. And there's a picture right there. And all I can remember in that picture right there is thinking to myself, Semper Fi. How about you, Peacock? You're going to be always faithful? Or the first time there's a little pressure, you're going to run like a stinking yellow-bellied coward? Traitor. Sell him out. What did he ever do for me? I'm eternally secure. Whatever does that make? I've heard all these people talk about, boy, if I was around during the days of Fox's Book of Martyrs and I was around during the days of the catacombs, if I was around in the days when the bears and the lions were ripping people to shred and they were burning people and using them for torches going up to Nero's, uh, Nero's palace up there. Man, if I was around in those days, you know, I'd be like the guy that got the robe and I'd be running and they could put me on the rack and, and I wouldn't deny him and stuff like that. And the Lord said, are you kidding me? It wouldn't take a rack. It doesn't take them pulling uh, your fingernails out or jamming bamboo under there or busting your teeth out with a hammer or drilling your teeth out or breaking your bones or putting you on a rack. It took four guys sitting there with smoking some dope and I asked you to give them a track. You ran like a little girl. Traitor. Traitor. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, let's go do something. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I would prefer you didn't do that. And you say, well, I, I understand that, but Betray one to go with the other one. Always faithful. I've got his pen and uh, he gave me his Marine Corps pen. It don't mean nothing to you. I understand that. I understand that. I got his Bible. You know what it says out there on the front? Big round circle on the front. Semper Fi. United States Marine Corps. I got his little uh, ball, his anchor thing there with a little ball on it and a little rope and so on and so forth. Marine Corps. He said, what does that mean? Well, that's My friend gave it to me. He was a faithful friend. Meant a lot to me. But I think to myself, have I been that faithful to him, to Jesus? I've had people run on me in different situations and different problems and they were scared and maybe they had good reason to run and maybe they thought they were more sold out than they were and, and those kind of things. And when push came to shove and things got kind of rough and they do at times, I've had them take off and run. And then the Lord said, well, you know how that feels, don't you? How do you think I felt? I didn't run. He was faithful to me, more faithful than a brother. Jude 8, likewise, also filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the body of uh, the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. He said, I'm not going to back off just because you're putting pressure on me. Second Peter chapter 2, I'm not going to back off, I'm not going to back away. You know what I know? I know that you're living in a day and time, ladies and gentlemen, where your loyalty to Jesus Christ is going to get put to the test, where you're going to be tempted and on a lot of occasions where somebody's going to say, uh, listen, why don't you go with us and heck with all that church stuff and heck with that Bible stuff and heck with this and heck with that. I mean, we got things to do, places to go, people to say, it's Sunday night. I mean, why, why don't we just go have fun? I mean, hang out by the pool. Let's go to the beach. Let's do all these other kind of things. I mean, after all, you got a virus going on and, and that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, well, I'd appreciate it if maybe you'd come to the church house for a little while. He won't be too long tonight. I can shut him up. Well, Lord, I like to, but I got to get up early tomorrow. I got to go to work, you know, and got, got work to do. Kids got to get ready. And I, Lord, I, I really, I, I mean, I, I, I really, oh, you're going to sell me out for a meal, are you, Esau? Traitor. 
Traitor. You know what that Bible says? Jacob have I loved and Esau have I what? Do you know? Do you know the passage? Have I what? You know why? Because he despised his birthright. God had that boy born into a position of privilege. He was going to be the high priest for the family. He was going to be the chief cook and the bottle washer and everything that's connected with that thing. You know what he did? The Bible says for one mess of pottage, he sold his birthright. Traitor. Traitor. After God gave you such privilege as that like that, you're going to sell it for just something to feed your belly? I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just trying to say, I think part of that will be at the judgment seat of Christ. I think one of the things, the work done in the body or out of the body, will be the choices you made when you made a choice to walk in the flesh and not walk in the Spirit. I'll be right there with you. I'm not saying I got it down pat. I'm simply saying, when you think about the decisions you make, doesn't it boil down to that? Doesn't the Lord say it's good or evil? It's God or Satan? It's either that or your flesh, one or the other, but which one wins out? Who's going to go to the cross? Executioner, send him to the cross. Crucify Traitors, traitors, heady, high-minded. 2 Peter chapter number 2, look in verse number 10. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh, lust after uncleanness, despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you God told you what to do. You're a, a, from another country and God gave you orders for you to follow. Uh, Luke chapter, or I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 16. And you know what happens? We say we'll follow the orders. We're no better than a nation of Israel. I told a friend of mine this afternoon, I said, one of the things I'm seeing right now, more so than prophetic events and es es ex eschatology, thank you, uh, uh, those events that are taking place in the future, I'm seeing a repeat of history. I see Eve over there saying, I want the tree. The downfall begins. I'm seeing Cain say, I'm not going to do what I got to do to bring you the right sacrifice. I'm seeing choices throughout that Bible where God tells the nation of Israel, they say they will and they don't. And God gives them a warning and they don't do it. And God said, okay, that's fine. And he brings in Nebuchadnezzar and he brings in Belteshazzar and he brings in the Medes and the Persians. And he says, I told you now, I've warned you, I've warned you, I've warned you, I've warned you. And then they come out there and after that whole thing falls, under the law. They bring the Lord in there. They crucify the Lord. And by Acts chapter number 7, they deny the Holy Ghost and, and they don't want anything to do with Him. And the Lord cuts that thing off right there. And the last cry they made is, Hid blood be upon, upon, upon us and upon our children's children. And the Lord said, Okay, that's fine. I got you covered. No problem at all. And by 1945, you got 6 million of them in one place and 9 million in another place going to ovens. Traitors. Traitors. They betrayed him. They sold him out. It wasn't just Judas. That was his people that he came to die for. That was Israel. Rome was just the instrument. Rome didn't put him there. The ones hollering crucify him were not Romans. They were Jews. That's the people he came to save. And yet he gave him another chance after the resurrection. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do, Steve. He said, come in here. I want to talk to you a minute. Now, I know you're a deacon, but I'm make you a preacher for right now. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Here's your sermon outline. Get up there and tell them how great and wonderful their beginning is. And talk, go from Abraham to Moses and really get them up high. And then let them know they denied the Lord that bought them and they crucified their Messiah. He said, I mean, lay them low, boy. I mean, drop the hammer on them. And boy, Steve gets in there and he gets to preaching them in there. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And aren't we special? And we're God's chosen people. And we're this and that and the other. Amen, preacher. Preach on. Boy, that's good preaching. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and Stephen pauses a second. And he said, and you crucified the Messiah. And I mean, just like that. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. They turn on him just like that. Because they didn't like what he said. It didn't matter if it was true. And the Bible says they stoned him, but they gnashed on him with their teeth. That's not a figure of speech. They're biting on him. They're that angry with him. And stoned him to death. And Stephen, I mean, must be some more kind of man. My goodness, man. He looks up there into heaven. He said, lay not this into their charge. My goodness. And the Lord cuts them off. And by Acts 8, there's Ethiopian eunuch. And Acts 9, the Apostle Paul comes out. Acts 10, Cornelius gets in. And by Acts 15, you're under what you're under right now, which is the age of grace. You say, why? They betrayed him. They hung him on a cross. Traitors. That's a trait of last day's Christians. When we get to heady, high-minded, then he's going to say, love her to pleasure more than God. And then he's going to talk about them having the power of God, but, I mean, having uh, godly, but having the, denying the power thereof. These are Christians he's talking about. 
How could you be a traitor if you're not already blood-bought? It's tough. Numbers chapter 16, you probably know the story better than I do. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 12, Moses sent and called Dathan and Abiram and the sons of Eliab, and which said, uh, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that flowed with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Land flowed with milk and honey. You smoking crack, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? What land are you talking about? You came from Egypt. You couldn't even get garlic and leeks together, man. You were in slavery. It's funny how you twist the story around there. He said, you brought us out of the land of milk and honey. We were having the time of our lives over to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into the land that floweth with milk and honey, promised to give us Canaan, or give us the inheritance of the fields of vineyards. Wilt thou put, the eyes of these, uh, put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth, and he said to the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I heard of one of them. Welcome to the ministry, Moses. Moses, you brought them out here from the land of Egypt and brought them across the Red Sea. They're wandering around in the wilderness now because of their own rejection of what God told them to do. And they're murmuring, griping, and complaining about the quail and about the manna and all the other kind of stuff. And the 12 spies go in and two come and say, let's go get them. And 10 say, let's don't. And they went with the majority opinion. As if the majority's always right. But people forget the majority hung Jesus on a cross. And you say, what happened? Traitors. You say, what happened? They didn't get what they wanted, so all of a sudden they spun the story, got it out on the social media, got everybody in there behind them, and Moses later on comes up and he said, okay, I tell you what, let's do. Let's have a showdown at the OK Corral. You know why that thing took place? Because God said, there's three boys right there that I'm going to take them and their families out, and I'm going to tell you why. Because they're corrupted, because they're just looking to get out of what I want them to do. They're my chosen people. I'm trying to take them to a land of Canaan, and they won't even fall in line and do what they're supposed to do. Traitors. You say, what's a traitor? Somebody that can't follow orders. Somebody that can't do what they're told to do. Just what I gave you myself as an example for. Deuteronomy, if you will, please. Chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. That word treachery is right there with traitor. That's that willful betrayal. That's a violation of allegiance. That's striking hands with somebody and giving your word and then going back on it. I have a friend of mine right now who has uh, been in the ministry for a real long period of time and uh, some things went on and they disregarded all the years he's been in the ministry because of one thing he said the wrong way. One thing. It didn't go quite the way they thought it ought to go. We're out of here. Well, it did pretty good for 30 years. We're out of here. Well, how do you know your loyalty until it rubs against what you really want it to be? There was a preacher that had a little bit of a disagreement with somebody over in Pensacola, and I won't give you names. You may know all the names. Both of them are dead now, but nonetheless, one of them was a Marine. And he disagreed pretty uh, vehemently with the preacher over a particular thing, and he made his position known and that kind of a thing. And then they got done with it, and a guy comes up to him after it's over and said, Brother so-and-so, he said, um, uh, are, are you leaving the church over this? And that old Marine kind of bucked up a little bit. He was in the D-Day invasion and stuff like that. And he said, why would you say that? And he said, well, you don't agree with him. And he said, yeah, but he's the commander. I'm doing what I'm told to do. He said, no, I'm not leaving. Why would you ask me something like that? Those guys were friends for 60 years. 60 years. Friends. You say, why? Uh, an individual that says, wait a minute, man, I may have my opinion, but I know where my bread and butter, bread's buttered. I realize that. Look, I'm not a Mr. Uh, dictator and all that other kind of stuff and have this heavy-duty pastoral authority and get all on your personal business and stuff like that. I give you more credit than you think I do. I don't go around this country and talking about people, what stupid sheep you are and how ignorant you are. I brag on you. I think you're the, they, they think you all around here wear white robes and gold crowns. <laughs> They do, every one of you. They think every one of you. They think all these kids around here, you know all the books in the Bible, you know all the verses of Scripture, you can get up and quote 10 verses on anything you want to ask them about. That's what they think about you. They really do. They think, they think y'all are, you know, here's the water. Y'all walk, y'all ain't walking on the water. Y'all above the water. That's what they think about you. Well, well, I believe that. But if we take a good solid look at ourselves, you know what you do? You, you got to realize I have that potential. And I hate it. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. 
Look at the Bible here when he says this in Deuteronomy chapter number 17, verse number 12, verse 12. He said, what was that Marine's secret? It wasn't just following orders. He realized there was something bigger at stake than just his opinion. Amen. No man is any better than his ability to take orders. Amen. That's what an old man told me a long time ago. You know what he said? No man is any better than his ability to take orders. Verse number 12, the man will do presumptuously, will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before uh, the Lord thy God or unto the judge. Even that man shall die and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel and all the people shall hear and fear and do, more presum do no more presumptuously. You know what he said? If he says to do it, you better do it or I'll kill you. <laughs> you better be glad you live in the age of grace. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21. You'll get the point here in just a minute or I hope so. Deuteronomy 21, come if you will, please, to verse number 20. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son, stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he shall die, that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And the man that committed the sin worthy of death, he is to be put to death, and thou shalt hang him on a tree. Body not remain until night time. So what is that? A kid that won't do right? I don't know kids that be all right with you. <laughs> hey, you talk about corporal punishment, man. That's what he said. That was the law. You want to go back and live under that? Not me. That means the times my dad whipped my hind in, if I hadn't turned around, he'd say, take him out and stone him. I'm not going to deal with him anymore. That's how God handled a rebel. You know what a rebellion, a, a rebel is? It's somebody that believes they know better than the person telling them what to do. Come to 1 Samuel. I don't believe I know better than God. 1 Samuel 10. I know the pressure's coming. I know the difficulty's coming. I know the choices have to be made. Moses comes down off of that mountaintop up there and he looks around at that mess going on and I got a whole sermon on it. I don't have time to preach it to you now. But he comes down there and he is spitfire mad, boy. I mean, he's looking at them. They're worshiping the golden calf just like church today. Preacher's been gone for a while. They worship a God they can see and a God they can love and a God that means something to them. And he comes down off that mountain and they're naked. That means they're not just in the sense of just being unclothed. They come down there. It's all about worshiping the people and what they want to do. And they're having a worship service. That's what it's called. And Moses is mad as a hornet. And he comes down there and he said, who's on the Lord's side? The next time that thing happened, he comes down there and they kill him by the thousands and hang their heads out there on the wall to remind the people, this is what God does to rebels. It's what he does to traitors. My goodness, man. I don't know, ever been in a real bad situation and you're kind of up to your eyeballs and alligators and the guy that you're there leaning on and depending on, he don't show up or he runs on you? And you get that sort of sinking feeling? I think to myself about a man by the name of Uriah the Hittite. He wasn't even an Israelite. He's out there known, uh, known for his fighting abilities and his uh, prowess on the battlefield and things like that. He goes home to, to see his wife Bathsheba and she won't have nothing to do with him. He shoes, proves his loyalty. The king says, go on to the house, man, and uh, you know, be with your wife and stuff. And, and he goes out and he goes to sleep on the porch of the king's palace. And he said, I'm not going to the house, king. He said, how can I go out to the house when my friends and buddies are out there fighting? I'm more loyal than that. I'm loyal to you. And the king gets him good and drunk and he says, well, you go down there now and stuff like that. And he goes to sleep out there again. And the next thing you know, that man is so loyal, he's carrying his own death warrant. Hands it out there to Joab and said, this came from the king, my lord. And Joab says to the boys, he gets the garrison together there and he said, okay, guys, come on in here. We're going to have a special forces meeting. He said, now, you know, we're going to charge the wall tomorrow. And the guy said, charge the wall. Charge the wall. You don't charge the wall. You know what that says about walking too close to the wall and about the people throwing rocks on you. Uh, we know better than to charge the wall. Well, I, I understand that. Well, there's a little different set of circumstances. You know, your eye is going to be with you. Yeah, he's usually for the meeting here. You know, well, we're letting him sleep in. You know, he's back home. He had a little rest there, a little R&R. He hadn't -E. battle hardened again. We just give him a little time to get his head together. He's got cotton mouth. He's a little nervous and stuff. Now, tomorrow, when the heat of the battle, when things get really rough and they're rushing out of the city and charge him, I want you to withdraw yourself from your eye of the Hittite. 
Uriah's out there slashing and burning, man. I mean, he's hopping and popping. He is going to town, slinging that sword, man. Blood's going all over the creation. The battle cries are going up all over the place. People are screaming for their life and hollering in pain and stuff like that. And Uriah's going out it, and the sweat's mixed in with blood and tears are flowing down his face and they're fighting literally gritted teeth, man. And bones are breaking and flesh is being sliced off of bodies and arms and limbs are going everywhere. And he hears the clang of the swords behind him and the shields behind him. And the next thing you know, I, if I could paint, I'd paint a picture of that guy sitting there drenched in blood and surrounded now by all these other ones. And I'd see all these other guys just backing away from him. And I'd have them lock eyes. And I'd have Uriah looking at him. And I'd have Uriah just lay his sword down and just betrayed. Betrayed. A plot hatched by a king. One of the greatest warriors, if not the greatest warrior in the Bible. A plot of betrayal. That'll read redder than any story you've ever read of Caesar and Brutus or anything you've ever read about Benedict Arnold. That thing is set up through that deal. And that thing, Joab comes out there and says, Well, you know what? If I carry this thing out, the king will be beholden to me from now on. And he was for a while. I think to myself, the Lord could depend on me and you in battle, spiritual battle, Ephesians 6 battle. Can He depend on you to do what He asks you to do with a husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church? Can He depend on that? Can you be true to Him? Can you be loyal to Him? Can you follow the orders or do you withdraw yourself from the field of battle, men? Ma'am, can you be submissive and subjective to your own husband as unto the Lord? Or ma'am, you withdraw yourself from the field of battle. Traitor. You're a traitor. You can't follow orders. Yeah, preacher, you don't understand. In the day and time in which we live and all that stuff, he wrote that book from way out there in the future. Don't tell me that book ain't up to date. He didn't put anything in that book that's not for you to be able to take. Boy, if I could paint that picture, man, that'd be one of the most horrible pictures. If I could paint that picture of, that, of Uriah looking there and his heart would be what would kill him. It wouldn't be the point of a sword. It would be like, man, I signed up as a volunteer in this army and I'm here to help you and why are you guys leaving me? I may not have him look out there at John and say, John, you remember the time that guy about cut your leg off and I pulled you off the battlefield? And hey, Joe, remember the time that we were so and so and such and such and, and uh, you kind of got up to your neck and alligators there and I came in there and brought the Calvary and we rescued you and... I'd have him going through that. That'd be little bubbles over and then just looking at him going, well, I thought you were my friend. Traitors. Christian cowards. Can't even follow orders. You say, what does he give you? He don't give you an order in there. He doesn't keep himself. He doesn't give you an order in that Bible that'd be bad for you. Not one of them. Not one of them. Not one of them. God don't do something bad to you. Everything God does is good. You say, but what about what's going on now? Why would you betray him like that? He said all things work together for good. Why would you hold him accountable for that? Why don't you think man deserves everything that's coming and then some? Why would you, why would you turn on him like that? You know, just make that kind of little snide, sort of a smart alecky, cheeky kind of a comment like that. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? A traitor. The trait of last day's Christianity. You hold on as long as it's advantageous to you. And then the first time, a little bit of conflict, I'm out. I'm done. Traitor. Traitor's here since Sunday morning, if I'm being honest with you. Sold him out. For what? I don't know. A board game after church? I don't know. A video game? A girlfriend? A boyfriend? A business deal? I don't know. I don't have no idea what your, char your, your cost is, your price is. But I know this, if I don't stay on top of it, I can fall for it. Amen. Look, if you will, please, are you in uh, 1 Samuel there? 1 Samuel chapter number 20. No, I'm sorry, 10. 1 Samuel 10, excuse me, and verse number 27. That's the one I'm looking for there. Sorry, it's highlighted. I should have known that. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. 
You know what they say? Uh, how's he going to take care of us? We're not going to do what he tells us to do. The Bible is replete with it. Come all the way over to the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalms chapter number 12. A lot of old text and illustration. I don't want to belabor the point. You say, well, I'm getting nauseated talking about it. Psalm 12. I hear this song we used to sing a long time ago. Uh, you probably remember it. Onward Christian soldiers owing on to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Fight the royal battle. Do you remember that song going on? And we're supposed to be a militant group of Christians that's fighting for the cause of Christ. Not whether or not you preserve your flesh by wearing or not wearing a mask. Or who wins politics. Or whatever your prejudice or preferences are. It's what are you fighting for? The Lord said, you honestly think I care about all that stuff? I care what you did for me. Well, preacher, you know, you have to understand a man's got to make a living. <sighs> Boy, you're barking up the wrong tree there. God didn't make you to make a living. You're not supposed to be uh, living to work. You're supposed to be working to live. But it's funny how that kind of worked itself in there now, you know, and our 30 pieces of silver has got a new look to it. It's, well, <laughs> I mean, I know preachers, not 30 pieces of silver, but a little over time and a little extra time and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and working a little and working on Sunday and doing, I got you. I know who you are. I know who you are. He knows who you are. And if you're honest, Judas, you know who you are. Just for a little extra. Nothing wrong. It's not a sin. You're not smoking and drinking. You're not cussing. You're not watching porn and hanging out with the girls downtown and going to the bars and, you know, doing the shimmy shake and all that kind of stuff. You're not, you're not doing, you, oh, you'd never do something like that. You'd just go to the church house and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Judas betrayed him with priests. I'm not trying to be hard on you, but it kind of sounds pretty rough. You say, what? I hate having to look at when the Bible says, you traitor, you. David Peacock, traitor. Traitor. Read your Bible today? No, Lord, I was busy. You are busy? Were you too busy? Really? Watch TV for six hours. You were busy, were you? Lady told me one time, she's dead now, but she told me one time, she said, Preacher, I don't know what the problem is, but I just cannot find the time to read my Bible. My wife got a thing in her inboxes back in the day before they cover it or do whatever the, they do with all that junk. And there's the thing in there, there's a paragraph literally about that size of, of over a hundred women in that thing. And her name was the sending one that she's sending all this stuff back to all these people and emailing them. You ain't got time to read your Bible, sister? I think I know why. You traitor. Sell him out for friendships, did you, Judas? Not, not business. Not work. Foolishness. Nothing else to do. Oh, no, you dick. You thought Brother Larry's the only one who could do that. <laughs> Psalm chapter 12, look in verse 1. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. Why? The godly man ceaseth. I talked to a young man this afternoon. You know what he needs? He needs you men to be men, Christian men. The godly man seeth that they've run. The faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with double heart, they speak. Come on down, look all the way. The Lord shall cut off the flattering lips and the tongue of them that speaketh proud things. Who hath said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Who is He to tell me what to do? How to talk? Where to go? How to dress? How to act? Who's he think he is? It ain't the preacher, sister. God uses a human instrument to tell you, sir. Sometimes he does use Balaam's donkey, and I understand that, but you have to understand. Come to Romans chapter 13, please. 
Romans chapter 13. You have to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. God uses instruments to try to get your attention, but our attitude is, you ain't telling me what to do. You know what he told Judas? That's the strangest thing in the world to me, Brother Mitch. I, 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 I think to myself, it's so strange because the Lord knows what's coming. Right? He literally is, takes the, the wash basin and the pitcher and a towel and he gets down there in front of Judas Iscariot knowing those feet are swift to betray him and they're going to go out and betray him and he's going to go to the cross, right? right amen. And he slips his sandals off and he's washing the feet and him and Judas are locked eyes and he knows and Judas knows and he washes his feet and Judas misses a chance to go, Lord, Lord, you know what? I, I, I'm, I, listen, I outed you. I'm, I'm just telling you right now, the, the jig is up. The things are done. We're finished. We're finished. I, I, I mean, could you forgive me? No, he just sits right there like. Jesus. The Lord's given him a chance to get it right. That's really the difference in him and Peter. Peter, you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Judas, you love me? Well, <laughs> you're worth about 30 pieces of silver. But then he betrays him and Judas goes back and tries to redo the deal and throws the money on the thing and they go out and buy a place out in the field where nobody can go, nobody has an unmarked grave and take that old rotten suicidal body out there and dump it in a place where nobody knows. Potter's field. That's the place of burial for a traitor. My goodness, man. How could Judas miss that opportunity? Well, he's the king over the children of pride. He'll work it out however you want to, man. But you got the Lord and Savior that are down there washing your feet. And that doesn't humble you enough to say, uh, I think I chose the wrong side. Um, I think I made a mistake. Uh, uh, yeah, I've seen you do some great miracles. Can you get us out of this mess? Not Judas. You know what I've seen? I've seen sometimes in Bible-believing Christians nowadays that once they make their mind up, I mean the Lord couldn't change them with a, with a mind-changing machine. They're kind of like, don't bother me, don't confuse me with the facts, I done made up my mind. Yeah, but the Bible says, I don't care, I've made up my mind. Romans chapter number 13, just pick up a couple of verses here if you will, please. Look all the way down to verse number, we'll just start in verse 1. Let every soul be what? be subject. I told a friend of mine today, the main theme of the Bible beside the second coming of Christ is authority. Nobody is not under authority. He says to obey is better than sacrifice. Why? If sacrifice is as important as you can possibly make it, imagine what the sacrifice would be without the obedience. We start in the garden. Abel did what God told him to do. Cain refused to do what God told him to do. Therefore, one sacrifice was accepted and one was rejected. Why? It wasn't the sacrifice where it went off the rails. Was Cain said, you're not going to tell me what to do and I am not going to make it right with my brother. I don't care if it hair lips you and the devil. Now that's in between the lines there, but that's what he's saying. Cain, don't you know if you brought, why is your countenance falling? Don't you know if you brought the right sacrifice? Lord, if I bring the right sacrifice, I got to make it right with my brother because he's the only lamb man in town. You think I'm going to my brother? Lord said, well, you'd rather have that than me, would you? You're upset that I didn't accept your sacrifice. I'm telling you how to get me to accept you. Go get the thing right with your brother. You got to be kidding me. No, I'd rather go down and be a murderer, be a traitor, be a killer. And have a line come from me that damns people to eternity because of their rebellion. That Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know what a traitor is? A traitor is somebody like Absalom. I don't care what daddy says. I'm going to do it my way. Absalom, your daddy's the king of Israel. He's the light of Israel. I mean, he's a giant killer. He's a bear killer. He's a lion killer. I mean, he's killed 200 Philistines on his own. I mean, the stories about David killing tens of thousands of people and a great leader of Israel and God's hands upon him. I don't care. It'll make no difference at all to me. Well, he's your dad. Yeah, but he didn't do right by my sister and I'm going to have my way. Uh, I would suggest to you, Absalom, why don't you let God handle that and why don't you just uh, make things right with your daddy? 
Absalom said, nothing doing. I'll sit in the gate and tell everybody how much better a preacher I am, how much better a king I am, how much better a father I am. I'll be their judge. And by the way, I'll let my hair grow out and I'll garner the people's attention around here with my good looks and my fair speeches and my kindness. I'll give the people what the people want and I'll be all that thing. And then eventually I'll get the support and I'll dethrone my daddy. Well, Absalom, you might want to hold off on that because your daddy never won a political election to be on the throne just so that you know in case you're wondering, uh, God put that boy on the throne. That boy was a little sheep coat out there taking care of some sheep and uh, the Lord came out there to him one day. He's tending the sheep and all of his brothers came up there and nobody passed muster and then the preacher said, you know, you got anybody else? Oh yeah, we got this stinking little red-headed runt out there. He takes care of the sheep. He, he's just, you know, a wine and cheese bear. He ain't much of nothing out there. I better bring him in. I want to talk to him. Walk in and the Lord said, that's the guy. Listen, man, God put him there. And all the stuff that happened is because of what God did for him. Now, Absalom, wouldn't it be just a good idea for you to accept the fact that maybe daddy made some mistakes, but still God, God with him? I don't care about his God or anything else. I want the throne. And I should get the throne. I'm a better king than he is anyway. You know, one of the strangest things about that story to me that I've never really grasped a hold of until you kind of get to studying the life of David. They come in there and they go, okay, David, we got the troops assembled. We got all the old guys together and we may not be able to move like we used to could move, but we can still put up a real good fight and we can come in this way and we can flank them over there and we can get a rear guard here and we can set up an ambushment over here and they're drawing out all this paper stuff. And David said, what are y'all doing? So, well, he's going to bring up a bunch of men here with some fresh horses and they're going to add some chariots and they got a few archers and things like that. But Nothing like, you know, like when we went over there, when the thing, the sound came over the mulberry trees. And remember when we fought so-and-so, David said, wait a minute, what are y'all doing? Well, Absalom's coming to take the throne. You know what David said? Let him have it. It ain't mine anyway. <laughs> David said, he's coming in the front door. I'll go out the back. That boy thinks he's ready to be a king. <laughs> Strap it on, big boy. Go get him. Have at it. I've had enough. <laughs> Man, have I made some messes as a king. Big ones. See you later. Goes out the back door. What's his face comes down. I can't remember his name right now. Cussing and swearing and throwing stones at him and hollering. Abishai grits his teeth, man, and grabs that sword and starts out there. And David grabs him by the back of the hoodie and he pulls him back. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to cut his stinking head off. He ain't talking to my king that way. And David says, well, I'll let him curse. Maybe the God will require me a, a, a gift for that. Maybe God will give me a blessing for letting him curse. God knows I deserve it. He said, I'll, I'll cut his head off. David said, you sons of Zariah. <laughs> and he keeps walking. And Absalom comes in and you know what all happens with the story. And the next thing you know, they come out there and they say, King, he's sitting over there looking down and staring into the fire, remembering all the stuff he's been through. And he's stirring around in the ashes and stuff like that. He don't have on a crown. He's not riding around in a charger covered in a horse sheet and those kind of things. And, and all the kings and the banners and stuff. Just looks like a common, ordinary guy. Just a plain old sheep herder. He's out there looking across those things and stirring up those ashes and watching those little blue flames come up there and yellow flames and the smell of that smoke coming up in that thing and he's thinking my goodness man life was better when I was nothing but a shepherd and that kind of deal and a guy comes by there and says your majesty and he said oh, you, that's my son now he's Absalom he's got the throne out no your majesty uh, <laughs> he's not there they're ready for you to come back he's abdicated the throne it's yours and David says did you do that <laughs> and the Lord said I'll let you know when I'm done with you I'm not giving a traitor the throne. You know what rings in me right there? I'm said I'm going to rule and reign when I get up there with Jesus Christ. I wonder if the Lord would say, I'm not giving the traitor a throne. I can't trust you, boy. I'm working on that. Loyalty is a big thing to me. You say, why? I see it in all the great warriors of the Bible. Friendship, that's a big deal to me. 
You may not like who it is and that kind of thing, but if they're my friend, you better be real careful tripping around that deal. You say, why? I ain't going to be your buddy just to let you keep walking on somebody. So, well, you should tell them. Maybe I can tell them and get away with it, but if you start telling them, I might maybe have something to say in the name of Jesus. That's how I feel when people talk about this congregation. Look, we got as many hemorrhoids as anybody else does, but it's nobody else's business. And I'm not outing people that are in here that have problems. And I don't appreciate it when somebody goes out and betrays the love and the care that these people have shown to keep the doors open here. I don't appreciate it at all. You say, what is it, traitor? I talked to my wife today about something that's going on somewhere else and you wouldn't even know what it is and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's a serious matter. And she said something pretty profound. She does that every now and then. She said something pretty, I'm not being smart, Alex. She just, she just, she just, sometimes she just says stuff. She don't even, she, it, it's not like with a lot of thought behind it. She said, well, I hear what you're saying. She said, you know what? He, maybe the guy is wrong, but I know this. The results of what's happened is not doing the body of Christ any good at all. All it's doing is just causing trouble for everybody involved. I said, you know what? You're right. Now, there's times you've got to grab the bull by the horn. I get that. I understand that. But in this particular instance, it would make a mountain out of a molehill. That's pretty profound. What was the benefit? Traitor. Traitor. Can't keep rank. Can't stay in line. Got to get the spotlight. Got to make sure everybody's watching. Can you give me just a couple more minutes? Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject, be subject, be subject. The higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be were ordained of God. Are you a Romans 13 preacher? Yep. And I don't care how many internet articles you send me about whether or not your pastor is teaching you to subject yourself to or that book right there just said to you who it is that ordained the powers. Amen. It didn't say it was your vote. I don't care if you vote. That's your right to vote unless you're a felon, which they may change that too after a while. Because, you, you know, we're sorry you wound up where you are. You take your right to vote and you lose your right to bear a firearm. You say, why? It costs you when, you when you commit crimes. But, you know what he just said? The powers that be, who are they ordained by? Well, then that means if I resist the power, who am I resisting? Look at verse 2. You're not betraying him, are you? Well, if that's true, you are. Doesn't he say something in that passage right there about they bear not the sword in vain? And if you hadn't done anything wrong, I'm paraphrasing, you don't have anything to fear from them because you haven't done anything wrong? Defund them? He said that's the, they're ordained of God. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You can defund them from now to the cows come home. You're always going to have some authority somewhere. And if it's going to be Hitler, it's going to be Hitler. Or if it's going to be Jesus Christ, it'll be Jesus Christ. But you're going to have an authority. A fellow asked me the other day, he says, well, what do you think is going to happen when Jesus comes? I said, he's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. He starts it off with a war. And he kills everybody that's against him. He said, what? I said, yeah, sweet Jesus. Sweet little baby Jesus, born in a manger. He's coming down, and if you're against him, he's going to take your head off. Amen. I said, they're going to be people running up buildings, getting people out of third and fourth and tenth story buildings, run up the walls, grab them out of the window, catch! <laughs> Throw them down there and run them down there, run them in front of the judgment. The Lord's going to say, get. So you're kidding. I said, man, that war is so great that that valley of Megiddo over there has blood flowing in it to the horse's bridle. I said, that's how he starts. When he comes down, who is this with dyed garments of Bozra? I said, that's the second coming of Christ. And he splatters them under the foot. There's your trampling out the grapes of wrath. Amen. I said, he's stomping on them. And there's your eastern gate being opened and all that. You need to be on the right side of that one. And then you know what he does? He sets up an order to things. You're a fool if you don't think that there has to be order in your household to have order in your household. Amen. Traitors. Come to Luke chapter number 21. Let me try to wrap this up. Make it Luke 22.
And this lets you know how close it gets. The betrayal in the last church, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't come from the news media, as much as some of you think it is. The betrayal in the last days, if the Bible's right, the pictures are clear, Korah, Dathan, and Barm were in the inner circle with Moses. If the Bible's right, the betrayal occurs, Naboth lives right next door to where the king is. If the Bible is right, by the time you move through there, Absalom betrays David, and that's in his own family. By the time we get right here, Judas is in the inner circle. He's traveled with him for three and a half years. And he's been a devil from the beginning. The betrayal comes from within in the last days. Notice what he says in Luke chapter number 22. Come all the way to verse number 21. In the interest of time, they're having the Lord's Supper there. But behold, the Bible says, The hand of him that betrayeth me is with me. Where? On the table. My goodness, man. Are you kidding me? Real quick, Matthew 26. This will be the last one. Matthew 26. Lord, you mean to tell me he's right there? Yep. Right here among us. Can I say something to you? It's just personal. It just uh, probably doesn't, you know, like the curl in the pig's tail. It probably don't add much lard to the pig. I'm trying to be sincere this evening and trying to be somewhat serious as you don't laugh and joke about it like most people do when they talk about this as if you would never do it. Uh, but can I say this to you? If somebody gives you the confidence of giving you their ear to tell you something in their life, they have a moment of weakness or something and they, uh, they, they give you a... Uh, a, a deep, dark secret. They tell you something that's personal to them. They made a mess. They did something they shouldn't have done. It is betrayal on steroids for you to then take that personal, private information and share that with somebody else. That's betrayal. You're a traitor. They trusted you enough to entrust you with something in the heart of their soul, in the seat of their soul. Maybe you don't understand what I'm about to say, and I'm not trying to get all philosophical, but you need to understand that when you're in a church service, you're emotionally vulnerable. You're opened up right now for your heart to be exposed, for your, not your head we're not having a math class. You're opening yourself up for all kind of emotions. Like some of you right now, you get under a little conviction. Some of you get a little bit mad. And some of you get a little, feel a little guilty. Those are emotions. And you have to be careful that we don't have what's called spiritual battery or spiritual rape because you're open to that and you're entrusting me with giving you what the book says and you're listening intentionally with your, uh, intently with your emotions. When somebody sits down with you and then winds up spending time with you to tell you after a period of time, look, I need to tell somebody this and it's bothering me. If they committed a crime, you got to report it. I understand all that. That's not what I'm talking about. If they do that and you cannot wait to get out and put it on your stinking social media or send somebody a text, a Snapchat or an Instagram or get a picture of somebody, you do permanent damage because you're a traitor and you don't just hurt them, you hurt your own self. Amen. And nobody will be able to trust you. You say, what are you? You know better than people that run out people's secrets on the National Enquirer. You see, preacher, that's a little bit, excuse me, that's a little bit harsh. You ever been betrayed? You ever sat down with somebody and kind of tell them your heart? And then next thing you know, somebody comes up to you and pats you on the back. Hey, I'm praying for you. If they wanted that person to know, they would have told them. Can you be trusted with a secret? One or two of you in here I've had a couple of conversations with over a year, a period of 30 years and things like that. If I did that, would you ever come back to see me again? You'd be a fool if you did. You say, well, we wind up being an illustration. Yeah, but nobody else knows that. You don't have to out yourself that way. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26, and I'm done, verse 21. This is the account of the Last Supper. 
Horrible, horrible account. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Interest of time, verse 23. They're saying, Lord, is it I, is it I, is it I, and so on and so forth. And he, dipped, uh, and he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Did you just get that? It's not him serving it. it he's dipping in at the same time the Lord's dipping in there. It, that kind of violates uh, authoritative protocol. That's saying I'm, I'm the same as him. Me and him, we're, that's a little too tight, a little too what we used to call fresh. You have to have a respect for the authority. No, sir, you go ahead. When you're done, I'll take what's left. No, I'm the same as you. Look, if you will, please come all the way to verse 48. Same passage. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same hold him fast. You know what he just said to you, ladies and gentlemen? Of course, Judas Iscariot is the one that did that. <clears throat> Judas even says to him around verse 24, 25 over there, you know what he says? He looks right at the Lord. You know what he says? Lord, is it I? Why, you devil, you, you've already done it. You just got to close the deal. You got to tell them where we're going after supper up there to Gethsemane so they know where to catch me. You know it's you. Lord, is it I? Why, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, you. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves and boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient to parents and traitors and traitors. Let it not be said of us that we are those that betrayed him. Let it be said of us, simplify. Lord, to the best of my ability, always faithful. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless your word tonight. And thank you for these folks enduring the, the preaching here this evening. Thank you for allowing me to have the privilege of having their ear while I talked with them a little bit. I pray you take these things and grind them down deep down in our heart. And that you, Lord, you might make them a part of us, that we might consider the decisions we make and the willingness to follow your orders. Father, bless these people, please, and watch over them and care for them. Give them the wisdom of Solomon and the strength of Samson in his great days. Lord, help us to have the discernment and do what we need to do and how we need to take care of our families. Lord, most of all, help us every day when we wake up to start the day by saying, perhaps today. And Lord, should you not see fit to come get us by rapture, help us to endure the day, to be a good testimony for you, to take the opportunities you present to us for us to be able to, to witness for you, to do something for you until you've got the final animal on the ark and you're ready to shut the door and take us to the house. Help us, Lord, to be it to be said of us that we would always be faithful. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.